Hey, Sean, guess what? I now have the best news in the entire world. What's the best news in the world, Richard? The best news in the whole world is that we have found a new home on the internet. A new home on the internet? Where's that? That's right. You can now find the language of bromance on the Pod Bros Network. The Pod Bros Network? We're bringing the bromance to the Pod Bros. Yeah, see? It's a bro and a bro. It's like bro. It's a bromance with bros. Podcast bromance. But not in a not in a weird way. In a fun way. In a fun way. In a bro way? Yes! <laughs> because how can you not love a network with other great shows like Dave's Nerd Compendium, Pencil and Link Reviews, and The Accidental Wrestling Fan? And they also have Players vs. Podcasts and The Guy Huddle. What's not to love? Right? It's a, it's a, bro, it's a bro union that couldn't help but need us. So, yeah, so check us out on all, all of our avenues, and then check us out now on Pod Bros Podcast Network. Like we always say, the best thing with geeks is camaraderie, and it's great to come by brothers in arms. Bros on Pod Bros. <laughs> What's up, everybody? I'm Richard. And I'm Sean. And we're speaking the language of bromance. And I, if if you didn't know this, I am a learned scholar. A scholar. I'm a learned scholar. You were the, the wizard, right, from your, your survey you took a while back? Right. Right. I am. So um, I just finished this book. Which I, I I will say it's kind of sad that like you know we have to celebrate like this is the at- <laughs> this is the attention span of 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 us these days is like hey I finished a book like I, I committed to something for you know more than thirty pages <laughs> look at me look at me pat me on the back oh me so I imagine you sitting there with like a graduation cap and a gown maybe like the the spectacle thing the one glass. No, the, I no. Uh, whenever I read, I, I tend to wear my smoking jacket <laughs> in the study with my pipe. This week on Language of Bromance discusses books from the past. Right, right. That's yeah, and that's me. And like I'm like, oh hello, I didn't see you there. <laughs> <laughs> like, close a book. But like it's open to like the first page. <laughs> and you just throw it to the side, like, hey, I'll read that later. Yeah. Procrastination. <laughs> She's a she's a sly mistress. Uh no, I just finished this book. It's uh it's an old well not old old book, but it's an older book. It's um Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain. And this this got me thinking that um the book is basically about uh it's kind of an autobiography on his part, but it also kind of gives you like that peek behind the curtain on what goes on in 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 his case like you know restaurant kitchens in Manhattan but i think it it shows what goes on in restaurant kitchens across the nation so is he is he a he's the is he like a cook or did he run like the full restaurant like the front and back or he was he was a head he was head chef at a lot of different places uh the Rainbow Room, which was in uh the which is the restaurant in Rockefeller Center, uh caters to a lot of people. Um he last chef's job he had before, you know, these books started taking off, um, was he was the executive chef at um Le Hal, which had uh restaurants in New York, Miami, DC, and Tokyo. So he was like executive chef and they kind of uh the, he talks about going to Tokyo. Uh, they bounced him over there to do some like consulting work and stuff like that. But he's worked in a, most of his work was in Manhattan, and it's just basically oh, it's, it's basically about like the crazy, insane shit that goes on in a kitchen, a restaurant kitchen that most people don't know about. And so, like the restaurants he he's working at, are those like those are probably like hundred dollar plates, or are they? Uh, they're, they're, I mean, it's, it's higher end, but, um, it's, you know, it's higher end, but that's also, you know, it's Manhattan and, you know, that Manhattan restaurant scene. Okay. So, I mean, uh, at one point he, he does, uh, become head, he's head chef of, uh, of his kind of not really his own place, but, you know, he has a lot more control over this one place and hires a bunch of guys that he used to work with and like the crazy shit that they do. 
like you know they used to like slather like their they made sure all their chef's jackets were like slathered in blood and <laughs> like like meat blood from the steaks and stuff or yeah yeah okay <laughs> Or, or if there was, if, you know, if if somebody cut themselves, then they made sure to like, you know, properly like christen their clothes and. <laughs> All right. Uh, like you know, cre- like most of the most of their uh most of their exploits are you know drug fueled and alcohol fueled and. So this is uh, like the rock star life of of uh, kitchen kitchen careers and uh, it is and all that kind of it, stuff. It okay. is it, and I mean it. It doesn't glam. I mean it. I would say it doesn't really glamorize. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. It does in the sense that, like, you know, I mean, you look back, you know, because, like, the stories that he tells about, you know, different things that go on in a restaurant kitchen, like, I can relate. Yeah. You know, I've worked in a kitchen since I was 15 years old. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, He used to, when he was a kid, he worked uh, as a dishwasher in... uh, in, in like a seafood place it was like a seafood kind of bistro and if and nobody's done dishes before that is probably one of the grossest jobs ever it it, and, it can be it can be well um, the, the grossest the grossest part about that that i remember i don't know if all restaurants are like this but i know the place we worked and it's probably safe to talk about this because it shut down but the person doing the dishes so they're the ones cleaning off these gross half-eaten plates and spraying soap all over the place was the same person that cooked the pizzas. Oh yes. And I, I remember, like, when I, I only did it a handful of times because it's nice because you got tipped out and you uh, you got like minimum wage or a little bit above minimum wage. Yeah, it was I minimum the first, wage. I remember the first time I did that, and they're like, "Oh, hey, you need to cook the pizzas too." And I'm like, "My hands are disgusting looking." I'm like, "Uh, my hands are gross. Like, shouldn't somebody else take care of this?" Like, no, it's the dishwasher's job. It's like, all right, let's get on it. Cook some pizzas. Um. So so he's working at a dishwasher in in this kitchen and he gets he, he does summers there and he gets moved up to working on salads. So he's you know making salads and stuff like that and uh during this particular night they're hosting a wedding party. So the bride and groom are there and like the bride, you know, and groom they kind of like walk through the kitchen and the chef, you know, kind of gives them a tour stuff like that. And uh so so the wedding party's going on um now this this bride is like in her wedding dress. Like she's, you know, mm. like walking around and, you know, talking to the chef and stuff like that. You know, in the kitchen in her wedding dress. Like in okay, her so wedding a, whites. Yeah. Nice. So at one point she um she she's talking to the chef and he looks at at Anthony and says, "Tony, I need you to watch the broiler. I'll be right back." Now for him, he's like, "Holy shit, I get to work the broiler." Like, <laughs> okay, for for people that like usually in a, in a restaurant like your broiler guy that's that's your top dog that's the that's the rock star that's that's yeah if you're if you're rocking broiler and it's a it's like you know it's like a weekend night like your broiler guy like that's your fucking ace in the hole like he's your he's your rock star he's your number Walks one Walks in with the golden flippers so he's thinking like Holy shit, yeah. So Anthony's thinking, like, holy shit, I get to work the broiler. Like, I'm going to fucking, like, rock this thing. So he's up there, and he's fucking, you know, cooking up steaks and shit like that. You know, chef's gone, and he's wondering, like, what the, f- you know, where is this guy? Like, he, I know he asked me to watch this, and I'm grateful, you know, that I get to, you know, but where where is he? He goes to the back door, looks out the back door, and over by... The garbage cans, like the dumpster and stuff like that. There is this bride with her hands on a fifty, like one of those big fifty-five gallon uh, trash trash cans, mm-hmm. bent over <laughs> in her wedding whites, getting rammed from behind by the head chef. Nice. Where's the Where's the husband in all this? He's still, you know, sitting there, like, in the dining room with his family and probably her family, like, all sitting and eating and, you know, enjoying themselves. Meanwhile, the wife, the recent bride, is sit is in the back, bent over a trash can, getting nailed by the chef. 
So I just imagine the mother-in-law like looking. I was like, oh, so Tony, where's where's Cynthia? At? Where's Cynthia? It's like I don't know. I don't know. I think she said something about wanting to get some tube steak somewhere, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Let me go check. But he says he even says he's like in this moment. This is when I was like, I want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> This is exactly where I want to be. I want to be in a kitchen in some capacity until I die. So did did they ever explain like how that worked out? Like how he talked the the bride into giving it up? Who knows? Does it matter? Uh, I don't know. I think that's a story I'd like to investigate because it it seems odd for a, a bride to go back in the kitchen with her husband out in front. And just to make that work out, like I want to know how that worked. Like if they knew each other or if he's like, it's like, hey, watch me flip these burgers. And that uh, got her got her going. So yeah, so I I it was it was a great book. It was, you know, it like, you know, I like there were parts in it that I that I laughed because I related. You know, it's it's it really captured what it's like to work in a kitchen with with a bunch of with a bunch of people. You know, he, he he says that, you know, the 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 kitchen is reserved people that cooks and chefs, you know, it's it's not a life for everybody. It's usually reserved for the transients, gypsies, tramps and thieves. Yeah. You know, that's that's your that's your employment pool. And and it's true. I mean, it, it doesn't matter where you go, kitchens everywhere are like this i mean that's that's what you that's what you get you get you know ex-cons or you know immigrants ex-cons <laughs> yeah ex-cons or future ex-cons a lot of i mean it's an immigrant population especially in a place like manhattan like you know you go to a, like an italian bistro i'm telling you right now that kitchen is full of fucking mexicans <laughs> it just is yes yeah. Yeah, I remember that's that's where we met is uh, at a at a sports bar it was just like a pub and grill kind of thing, and uh, I always remember there being like this big divide between like the front and the back. Like the kitchen people hated the servers, the servers hated the kitchen people, and I mean I tried to get along with everybody, and I don't know I don't know how long it was before you actually like, kind of accepted me, but it seemed like everybody back there, you know, accepted me as kind of one of their own. I think it's because at one point you started working some kitchen shifts. Yeah, I like did that's all. Lot, that's yeah. all you need. That's all you need to do. Just, just work back there, and then, and then it's like, okay, all right, this motherfucker knows the struggle. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, one of the best parts. Uh, I don't know if you remember this or not, but um, I think I messed up in order. Like I, I rung in the wrong thing or something like that. And I came back and let let the guy know. I was like, hey, I'm not supposed to have cheese on this or something like that. And uh, the guy's like, well, what's it matter? You're going to tell them we fucked it up anyway. And I was like, no, 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 no. If I fuck up, I tell them I fuck up. If you guys mess up, I tell them you messed up. I keep it real. <laughs> and he kind of shook his head. And I remember you kind of stamps like, no, yeah, that's what Sean does. He'll, he'll, he'll accept his mistakes. Yeah. Aw. It was a sweet, tender moment. It was. I think we locked eyes, and I think I cried a little. A little. <laughs> Inside. <laughs> No, I, I ran around back and hugged you. That was always my favorite part was to sneak back there with you guys and just kind of hang out. I, you know, I, like I said, I've been working in a kitchen for, you know, since I was 15 years old. And I mean, I've seen crazy shit. I've done crazy shit. But it really is. I think that like from that experience, I really have not been able to adjust into like a normal working world yeah like i couldn't i don't think i could function in like an office setting simply because i i you know i'm partial to making dick jokes and you know and being very you know like boisterous and loud and fucking and, and i i don't think it would go over in in a team building meeting <laughs> You know, I mean, like, we had team-building meetings when we worked in a kitchen. It was you get off at fucking midnight, and you hit the bar and drink until 2 or 3 yeah. in the morning. Sometimes you pay for the liquor. Sometimes you don't, depending. Right. Uh, I'm trying to, like, I, I, could give you, I could give you tons of stories. I mean, you know, smoking weed in the freezer to, pe <laughs> to people having sex in coolers. 
or offices or in the or on the bar when the place closed or um i mean people you know just people just like I, 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 there was this one place I worked where like, I, there were these two guys that would just like back their, back their car up to the back door. And then like, that was their grocery shopping. Oh, they just nice. went through and just grabbed shit and threw it in the fucking trunk and off they drove. Like, and that's, and that, and like all those things, like all these things that were like, that in, in a lot of places would be grounds for not only dismissal, but probably criminal charges <laughs> being filed. It seemed like, not only acceptable, but almost fucking par for the course. Well, it's like that lettuce is going to turn in a couple of days, so why not take it? Yeah, I mean, and oh yeah, they're smoking weed in the freezer. You know, that's at least they're not doing it on the line. <laughs> at least they're not doing it over your food. But it makes me wonder how many people that you know they're out in the dining room, sitting down, having a meal. How many of them actually have an inkling on what goes on behind those fucking swinging doors? I imagine a majority of people, especially the ones that have never worked that kind of job, probably think of it as kind of like this magical land where everybody's putting in 110% to make you the best meal ever. When in reality, they're just trying to get shit out the door and make it till midnight. Right. So we can fucking knock off and get stupid drunk and, and do it all over again. Yeah, no, I only worked uh, about three and a half, four years in a restaurant. And I know the first, like, two or three years we worked together, like, we had a really good owner, really good um, uh, manager, and, like, it went really well, but then some people stepped in, and it kind of sucked for a bit. It did. And, and that's about the time I quit, So, and that's the only place I ever worked at with, with you was there. Okay, so, um, so were there, I mean, are there any, like, insane, crazy fucking stories that I don't know about that you know about? Oh, uh, not not really. I mean, I didn't really get to see a lot of that stuff. I mean, a lot of the things that were awesome about working there, you know, I kind of shared those experiences with you. Like some of my favorite things are is we at the, the restaurant we worked at, it was in the mall and it was right next to a bookstore. And so once a month, the bookstore would throw out old magazines oh, and everything. Yes. And uh, and for about six months to a year, we did uh, porn dumpster diving because they'd dump it all in this clean dumpster and you'd jump over and because they just tore the covers off. Right. And you'd go through and like toss out, like, okay, here's a couple good ones. Here's some good ones. Yeah. You have this giant box full of fucking, <laughs> there's this giant box full of like penthouse magazine. And like the only thing that's missing is the front cover. Yeah, so like, they rip the, you know, because they rip the front cover off so you can't resell it and then they throw it all away. Well, as soon as that happened, fucking, I'd be in, I would, I, it was me. I would do it. <laughs> I, I jump in this dumpster and dig this box out and then just proceed to start throwing porn at everybody. Like, How'd you figure out that's what it was? I just remember one day walking back like, we found a shitload of porn. I don't know. I really don't know. I think it was yeah. because they would throw out books. They would throw out actual books. Yeah, I remember them doing that. And you... and I was like, holy shit, like there's fucking like books in here. And I I actually, you know, I, I read a lot I, I actually a lot of some of the books I have, you know, are missing the front cover because they were, you know, like sci fi fantasy, you know, books like that and you know, it was a way you know, it's it's a free book. Yeah, like, I mean if it's I mean, gonna yeah, get I'm not gonna anyway. re yeah, I'm not gonna resell it. I mean, obviously, I want to read it. I'll, you know, and a lot of books I read, and then you know, I, you know, gave them away or put them up at a yard sale or something like that. Uh, but I think one day I was looking for, I, you know, I was like, hey, you know, let's see if they got any new books. And I was like, it's all magazines. And I'm flipping through. I'm like, holy shit, this is porn. Imagine you open it up. It's like a uh, Pulp Fiction when they open up the suitcase. It's just like this shining light. It was. That's how I felt. I felt like I was blessed by the gods. Porn. So I would, yeah. I'd, so you know, I I walk around with this stack full of fucking porn mags and start throwing them to all my chefs, <laughs> and then I'd like tear out the uh, the pictures. I remember one day I tore out a bunch of the pictures and plastered them all over the office. I remember that. So Did you put some on the line? I maybe. Is that where I, most I, of them I, went. If I remember, I just remember I put a shit ton like all over the office, like just taped them on the walls and the door and the computer, and I was like, "This opening manager is gonna have a fun time." <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, 
Smoking weed in the freezer. That that was at the very the very first restaurant I ever worked at, which is which also closed. Um, that's you know, that's one thing I will say about working. I mean, ever you hear that statistic about restaurants that you know, like one in five close. You know, I think it's like one in five close every year. But like twenty percent of your, you know, I I think it's higher. Yeah, it's hard to make money in a restaurant. It's so hard. It's so hard to make money, and it's so hard. You know, I mean, there's. I would say that. Let's see. I'm trying to think. Well, I think out of all the restaurants I've ever worked at, I think there's only maybe you know, and I've worked. I've been in six or seven. I think there's only one, maybe two that are still open. Well, I think a lot of it, at least the one that we worked at, it seemed like people kind of jumped in thinking they, they knew what to do, and they I don't think they had a clue. But you kind of run, in, especially, like, it's the town that I that I lived in, you know, that coupled with that type of industry, you meet a lot of the same people. I mean, I worked with the same people at, like, two or three different places. You know, you just end up running into the same people. Because it's just what they do. They find the next... Yeah, you just... Some place closed, and you go on. Everybody went to the next thing, or they found a better job, and you know they took. You know, like there were a lot of places that you know you quit and you go to the next job, and then they have an opening, so you call up the old place, and you're like, "Hey, there's an opening, and this place is way better than that shithole that I just fucking <laughs> left. Like, why don't you come over here?" Yeah, I remember like in that town that we're from, it's it's small enough that whenever something new opens up for like the first like five months, like especially as a server. You just make stupid money. Oh my god! I mean, like I started so fucking busy. I started like a month maybe after uh, the place that we met opened up, and I mean, I was I was only there for like four hours a night, but I was making like two hundred bucks a night easy. Like, oh yeah. If I didn't walk out with two hundred bucks in cash, I was surprised. Like oh, it was yeah. just unheard of. And what's crazy is the people that started like right when it first opened, they were talking like they're making three, four hundred bucks a night, like just like clockwork. Yeah, um, my I remember. That place in particular, I think my first paycheck had, like, 20 hours of overtime on it. Oh, wow. Like, I was working, like, 7. I was working, like, 7 in the morning till, like, 5 or 6. And that was six days a week. It was it was nuts. It was just fucking nuts. So that's kind of a – so, I mean, not to really bring it back to kind of an origin story, but, I mean, that's where we met. Um, what brought you to that place? Just it was uh it was an ad in the paper. Okay. Yeah, you know, I was working at I was working at one place and I was just you know I mean like you 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 make money and you know everything's okay and you just chefs to me are a lot like mercenaries. You know you go where the fucking money is. Yeah. You know every job that I ever every job that I took I always made more at that job starting than I did at the place I left. It's just kind of like you look at that you've got the experience, and then it's right. they actually have the hours to give to people. Right. You always, you you always trade it up. I always trade it up. I never, I never, tr- I never took a step back. Gotcha. Every every restaurant I worked at, I always started out making more than the place I was. I I was at, and th- so you just go, you know, until you hit like usually you kind of hit like a glass ceiling. Where, you know, fucking, they're not going to give you any more money. So that's when you start looking for the next thing. Gotcha. So what's your uh, what's your most memorable memory of that place? Of that place in particular? Yeah. I totally actually forgot about the porn thing. That actually kind of seemed, <laughs> that actually seemed kind of normal. There was one night uh, I had to bail, I had to bail somebody out of jail. And I I'd, I'd actually had to take money out of the safe to bail somebody out of jail. That Do was, I, I know I know this person. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I know the story you're talking um, about. I did, yeah, I did take money out of the safe to go bail somebody out of jail. Um, I had a lot of people that were on. I I was a manager. I was a kitchen manager there. Um, there was a lot of people I had on work release. You know, a lot of people <laughs> yeah. that like, you know, they want they came in and they wanted to work. Like, I'll work fucking fifty hours, and I would. I'd schedule them like, you know, I'd schedule them twelve hour shifts. Because if they weren't working, then they were in fucking jail. Uh, you know, they 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 let them out, and then they 
they'd hightail it over to the fucking to the store and they put in a fucking 10 hour day because they as soon as it was over then they'd have to head right back and check back in and crash out on a metal cot uh, I've been in that that place before. I haven't been in it, but like visited, and it just that seems miserable. I would work thirty hours in a day, even though there's not just so I would never have to go back there. Exactly, and that's what they all did. And usually, I would kind of fudge it, and like I would, you know, I I put down that, you know, oh yeah, you know, I I'd let them punch out at like you know six thirty, and then. I you know, and then the jail would be like, oh yeah, he'll um he punched out at eight. Usually gotcha. give him like an hour, because usually they'd end up all they all they'd say is you know I just need. Usually they just like would run like home like to their actual house and like grab a shower and maybe a meal, and mm-hmm. then before they headed back. But yeah, they put in like twelve hour days because what the fuck else are they gonna do? It's either that or sit in jail and read a magazine. And most of them were in there for like petty things too, wasn't like DUIs and yeah, things like that. Yeah, it's usually like DUIs or fucking like possession or something yeah, small. Yeah, something fucking stupid. But yeah, I mean, it was it was always easy to score drugs. It was always you, you always had there was always somebody in the kitchen that fucking that was dealing like on the side, like that was their other job. You know, I'm always curious about this. Like, I mean, because I hung out with you, and I hung out with quite a few people. That I don't know if you were if you were doing anything at this point in time, but I know one of the managers were, and they all knew that I didn't. Right. And so, like, I never knew any of that was going on. So I always kind of felt like if I walked in the kitchen, like I'm Mister like oblivious to it all. Uh huh. And so I imagine you guys back, like, all right, let's see, I want a dime bag, and I walk in, I'm like, doo, 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 doo. hey guys, what's going on? What's that in the bag? Some paprika? Woohoo! All right, well I'm gonna go check on my table. See what you in a this buying and selling oregano. This is stupid. You're in a kitchen. There's a whole thing of it right there. <laughs> Here, put a little on my plate. Sounds good. All right. Bye guys. <laughs> it's like, what's wrong with that guy? It's like, ah, oh, he's alright. He's cool. But what well, I mean, yeah, I think I. It it kind of amazes me that a lot of people don't realize that like. In a kitchen, it's it's fucking it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. At oh, least yeah. it was I'm, in my kitchens. You know, it was fucking like you have a radio that you crank up, and then oh, the radio. You have a radio that you fucking crank up, and like you know, people are you know hanging out and fucking laughing and fucking around with each other and slapping each other with fucking snapping each other with towels and like yeah, like a like beating the shit out of each other and burning themselves and cutting themselves and. Have like you know sex in the walk in and for that for that bit that when it was really nice like it was like a big club like we were in this like this fun club together and like every night was fun like there was some nights that sucked obviously when you had bad customers or whatever but for the most part it was it was a lot of fun and you know and I I can say that that experience is is um it's it's pretty much like every single other kitchen I worked in. And I'm sure it's like, you know, kitchens across the nation. Like that's those these are the people you work with. And, you know, you fucking crank out a shit ton of food and then everybody hangs out and gets stupid fucking drunk. Yep. like I had a uh, I, it was it was really strange for me to go to. I, I worked in a hospital for a while uh, in, in I mean, it was still a kitchen, but. It was such a culture shock for me coming from, you know, working in restaurants and stuff like that to getting to this kind of environment, to that kind of environment where didn't make dick jokes all the time and and things like that. And, you know, a lot of a lot of the other people that work there, like, had never worked in a restaurant. And so they seemed kind of like foreign to it. There was this kid uh, that asked me one day he was like he was like richard you worked in a lot of restaurants i was like yeah you know quite a few he's like did you ever see that movie waiting <laughs> and i said i said yeah i've seen it he's like is it is it really like that i was like and i looked at him dead in the face and my expression completely dropped and i'm like it's exactly like that i remember That's like we exactly were right how it is right in our heyday when that movie came out because i think you and you and i went and saw a movie and that trailer came on and we both looked at each other like we need to see that movie everybody that like, worked in a restaurant was like i need to see this movie yeah it's like that is exactly what it's like to work in a restaurant 
Yeah, I just I remember like because that the place we worked at that was the first place I ever got like completely drunk, and I remember. Uh, there was some girl that went in the bathroom and I followed her and I tried to like jump over to peek at her because she knew I was in there and I oh, hit wow. my head on the railing. <laughs> and so then her and I like, she's like, let's army crawl. I'm like, all right, whatever. And so we army crawled underneath one of the booths, booth 46. And uh, nothing happened, but we both just end up passing out. Uh, <laughs> end up getting sick for the first time. So the, the manager at the time, uh, he's like, you know, you're not going to be able to drive. So let me take you to my place. I was like, all right. And so we get to his place, and he's like, listen, he's, he's, he was talking about this, uh, is it Ben Harper or something Harper, some musician? No he was idea. talking about that guy, like, all night. He's like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. You lay here on the couch. I'm going to put this in, <laughs> and we can watch this. You know, I'll sit out here and watch it with you. I'm like, whatever, dude. I pass out on the couch, and for, like, the next, like, six hours, the intro music, like, on the menu played over in a loop for, like, ten. <laughs> it was like a 10-second loop. So I just heard this over and over and over. Um, it was awesome too. Cause that girl, like maybe a month or two later, uh, I don't know if she called me or texted me, but she's like, Hey Sean, you remember, you know, that one night I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I remember. She's like, did, did we have sex? I was like, no, <laughs> trust me. We did not have sex. <laughs> there was nothing functioning on me. Trust me. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, that was fun. But I know her and I, like we, f- booth 46 was always our thing. But there was like there's a lot of fun things that happened like with that. Um, I remember there was a couple of lesbians that worked in the back. Uh, yes, I don't remember their names. Yes, um, the one the one girl was awesome. Like I always loved talking to her. And, oh, I love um, my girls. Oh, they're awesome. Uh, they would constantly like they just like because the thing, the thing with a with with a with the kitchen is I mean, the, the people that you work with. I mean, honestly, uh, the only analogy i can give is is like it's like they're like war buddies oh yeah you know like that's the kind of like bond that you have with these people that you form with these people there were i mean there were nights where like everybody's back there and everybody's cooking and a couple people are usually drunk and these two (laughs) girls like all of a sudden would start like just flashing their tits around oh yeah like so i got like two lesbians running around in the back fucking lifting their shirts up like flashing people (laughs) and like i'm sure like i'm sure there was probably some like wide-eyed fucking server that walked through those doors and like what the fuck is going on back here i always tried to talk to one because her mom was a server she was a little bit older and her and i always flirt all the time and uh her daughter and i would always flirt a little bit and I, i don't know if she was joking or not but she always says if she was straight that she would you know go out with me you know go on a date with me and her mom was always like, you know, you'd make a good son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was great. Uh, that's awesome. But yes, kitchen. I think, I honestly, I think it's something that everyone should do. I don't know how to function as a normal person in the world, and I think one of the reasons for that is is because I've worked in a kitchen for so long that things that I think are socially acceptable apparently are not socially acceptable. It's it's so, it's socially unacceptable to make dick jokes at people and then assume that they don't feel harassed. Yeah, I know I haven't worked in the kitchen for like seven years, but like at least once a year I have that like dream that I have way too many tables and I can't get to one. <laughs> I still have those dreams. I'm trying to think if there's a... The only other story I remember is uh, this one time we were staying late, and uh, there's these two girls. Both they weren't lesbians; they're just hanging out. And all of a sudden, they start talking, and the one's like, "I've never kissed a girl." The other one's like, "You've never kissed a girl? Do you remember this?" Yes, because and I was sitting on the other side of the <laughs> bar watching this, and then they started talking about their breasts, and then all of a sudden, like they start like, "No, your breasts are fine," and like, like they start touching each like, like. She's touching her breast, and then the other girl's like, "Well, if you're touching mine, I'm gonna touch yours." And they start to, and I'm sitting there on the opposite side of the bar. I'm like, "Is is is this how porn starts?" <laughs> I remember like your eyes were just huge. Of course, my girlfriend at the time was there, and I think she was like getting pissed off at this. So she's like, "I gotta go." I'm like, "Oh, okay, bye." She's like, "You want to walk me out?" I'm like, "Uh, damn it!" 
And I walked away right as like, oh, well, and they started kissing. I just hear you like, does this really happen in real life? Apparently it does. I <laughs> didn't think it would. I thought it was something the porn made up, but apparently it actually happened. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, there's like a lot of those people that I haven't seen since then. I, it'd be awesome. Like, the, like, I would rather have a reunion of that time in my life than like a high school reunion. I know. I mean, and the thing is, is that people that I met in those kitchens, I took with me to other places or they, you know, or they would be like, man, I'm looking for a job. I'm like, you know, I'm working at this place. Let me try and get you in. And like there were, I know there's at least a couple of people that I've, that I worked with in three different fucking kitchens. And, you know, you kind of, you kind of form that bond and you, there's an, and there's a camaraderie and, I don't, that's also something that I don't see in like, in other work settings, like an office or something like that. And yeah, not for the most part. I mean, you might, you might have people get referenced, but it's, I wouldn't say it's anything like a kitchen or a restaurant in general. Yeah. Cause I remember, you know, our place started slowing down a little bit and then a new restaurant opened like not even like a hundred yards away. Right. And so, uh, like, a lot of the servers started going over there because they knew they were going to make mad, stupid money for the first couple of months. Right, right. Um, so it's it's getting cold out, and this is another story I remember. And I kind of want to talk about because I don't know if I ever heard what happened from this. And uh, so you were closing, and I was closing. You were the manager at the time, I believe. And it was this, like, like middle of January, like, way below freezing. And uh, we close up, we walk out, and I didn't. I usually never brought my coat because I left it in my car because I didn't want to get it to smell like the restaurant. Right, right. And so you get get in your car because you. I think you already had it started. You yeah. say, "Hey, bye, Sean." I'm like, "Okay, bye, Richard." You jump in, drive off. I try to unlock my car door and I can't get it unlocked. Oh shit! And so I'm like trying to fidget with it, trying to open it, and I'm like, "Fuck!" I kind of like look for you and wave, but you're already gone. And I was like, "Shit, what do I do?" Uh, so I end up walking over to the McDonald's that was close by, which my aunt worked at. She let me in, and we end up getting in and everything. But I thought I heard a story that my mom ended up calling and was upset. Did that I actually no, happen? I have no idea. Okay. I was always worried about that because you and I were just starting to become friends. And, like, here I am, this 19-year-old kid. <laughs> and your mom called. Yeah. I was worried my mom Where's called. Where's my and Shawnee? Bitch- it's like, my Sean was out in the cold. He might have pneumonia. I want to talk to the manager now. <laughs> Mom. Oh, that's awesome. So that didn't happen? No. No, okay, I, don't, I, don't, I don't recall <laughs> getting a call from an angry mom about her baby in the cold. I just remember, so my parents ended up, my dad ended up coming to help me out to try and figure out how to get this. I tried hot water and everything, but the car was so far away from everything I couldn't get to it. Um we eventually popped the trunk, and I crawled through the trunk of the car and got in that way. Damn. It was fun. Well, that's good, my mom. My mom didn't call and bitch you out. I'm glad about that. So to sum it all up, if you've never worked in a restaurant before, behind those doors in the kitchen, you have a very savory group of people um, that are, and there's a multitude of sex drugs and in in the kitchens I worked in because I usually had control of the radio, rock and roll. A lot oh, yeah. of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, people smoking out back, smoking weed out back, smoking weed in, in the cooler. Um, sex in the kitchen on occasion. Uh, a lot of stolen food. Uh, we usually, nobody I really thought of, I, I don't really recall anybody stealing the booze. Because the booze was kind of under more lock and key. I think for the first bit, it seemed like we kind of got away with it for a while, but then somebody started taking notice. Yeah, yeah. It it kind of became it's like, listen, if you buy liquor, we have to charge you for it, but draft beer, we can get we can get away with that. Right, right. I'm so glad this place is closed now. Oh yeah, it kind of had a rough end there. Otherwise, we would never air this episode. It's just something then, we would yeah. play to each other. <laughs> It's like okay, uh, Sean and Richard in the court of law. <laughs> like, no, it's the statute it's, of limitations on <laughs> public indecency. <laughs> plastering well, corn all, all over the. All this over is the all place. made up. It's just a story. This right. really didn't happen. It's all hypoth- it's, hypothetically, <laughs> if we were to steal, if we were to steal food and plaster porn all <laughs> over an office. Oh man, I love that place. 
So anyway, so uh, I recently I went and saw a movie. Ooh. Um, you might have heard of it. It's uh by the great um Christopher Nolan. Or at least he's self proclaimed great. Uh, I think actually I think a lot of people call him great. He's a lot of people do call him great because because he had because you had the 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 you know the Batman trilogy. You, then you had after that you had Inception. I haven't seen Inception. Seen the Batman trilogy. He had a uh, Memento, which I liked. Uh, yeah. uh, but so there there's there's four movies I was thinking about that I was very very close to just getting up and walking out of. Uh, we all know uh, Spider Man three. We've talked about that yes. in depth. Yes. Uh, there was uh, the Traveling Pants, the sister of the Traveling Pants. What what possessed you to for this one? Was there a girl? Uh, there was a girl. Okay. Uh, that's, we were just, that's all. That's all you need. Yeah. We were just starting to hang out. The best thing about this is so she's like, I really want to see this movie. And our cousin was a year or two younger than us. She was a little bit younger. So she's like, well, I was like, well, you know, let's all three go. It's no big deal. I'll pay for everybody. And so we go and like she was like absolutely in love with this movie. And her cousin and I kind of look at each other. It's like, this is fucking stupid. Right. Right. Um, I actually closed my eyes and took a nap during that movie. Like it just was terrible. Uh, there was uh, P.S. I Love You. Went and saw that with a girl. Wanted to hang myself. It was terrible. Uh, you know what? I, I actually, I actually, I, I might have to fight for that one a little bit. That, actually, that movie actually wasn't terrible for me. The problem I had with it is it's like this great, great love story. And like four weeks after her husband dies, she's banging one of his best friends. And the girl that I went with is like, no, no, he wants her to be happy. He loves her so much. He wants her to be happy. It's like, listen, if I die... At least wait six weeks before you start banging one of my best friends, please. Just six weeks? That's your cutoff? Well, I mean, at least. I mean, it's a little insensitive otherwise. I thought I thought the timeline was a bit longer than that. I thought it was... It might have been, but I, I really feel like it was real tight. Like, it seemed like... Plus, you're in another country. If you're in another country, it doesn't count. Yeah... I don't know. You're I'm in another country a... <laughs> and, and the husband's dead, so I'm, I'm saying it doesn't count. I don't yeah. know. It's. I, I mean, I. I. All. I. All I'm saying is that I didn't think P.S. I Love You was terrible. Although I will say it did really fucking set the bar for what you have to do even after you're dead, that as true. as a man. Then you're like, shit. Now I gotta come up with a fucking scavenger hunt. <laughs> so so that way I'm a good husband. <laughs> Like Jesus well, Christ! Like, cause my wife watched that movie and she's like, "Oh, that's so." I'm like, "Now I got to do this shit. Now I got to come up with a fucking scavenger hunt for you after I die, so that way I'm a good fucking husband." Well, all it is is a condom in the address of your best friend, if if he's not in another country or like, not. Like Jesus fucking Christ! <laughs> like, can I? This is the problem with romantic comedies: is that it sets this fucking bar. That now you, as the significant male significant other in a relationship, now you have to meet. You have to meet this bar because if you don't, then you're an insensitive piece of shit. And yeah, so now I have death. to come up with this fucking like looky loo after I die. Like, how am I? What, what, what? And, and it has to be not, it has to be at the very least, has to be as good as what fucking Gerard Butler comes up with. Yep. That's a lot of work, too, especially if you're on your deathbed. Like, do you really want to be writing all these letters on your deathbed? Plus, she has a total lady crush on, uh, 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 shit, Gerard Butler. Yeah, she, oh, yeah your wife. She's, yeah, she's totally, she totally crushes on Gerard Butler. I think it's because of 300 when, when he had the beard, you know? I remember uh, some girl was talking about him for some other movie. I was getting my hair cut. I couldn't picture who he was because I'm real bad with actors' names. And she's like, yeah, he's in such and such movie. And, of course, I, I don't say 300. I say, oh, you mean P.S. I love you? She's like, oh, that's cute. You know, like most guys would say 300 and, and you come with P.S. I love you. Like, oh, do you want to go out sometime? She's like, oh, I thought you were oh. gay. <laughs> no, but you're a great friend. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the other movie I really wanted to walk out on was uh, The Pirates of the Caribbean. I went to a midnight release. And it was the one where they have the sword fight on the uh, thing that's, like, rolling down the hill. Oh, so that's the second one. I think so, yeah. Yeah. So I have four movies that I wanted to walk out on. I'm going to add a fifth movie to that. Oh. And that's going to be Interstellar. Ouch. It was inter Unstellar. All right, I've been all right, I've, I've, all right. <laughs> it was not all right, all right, all right. So... 
this is like this like supposed to be this massive like outer space movie and, and maybe I just maybe I missed something maybe there's some deeper meaning into it but okay like, I need I I have actually not seen much on this movie so what I need I need I need the synopsis like give me give me give me a picture give me a trailer okay so this is gonna be spoilery so the idea is Earth is basically not able to sustain human life anymore as, or at as least well we know this. And it it still sustains it enough, but like, there's a lot of crops that have that are like basically extinct. So the only thing that we can grow is corn. Um, it's really dry. There's a lot of dust. Um, so they they need to find a way to make sure that the human life continues. Okay. Um, NASA's been shut down. Like so, they they're not even like like training people to be anything but farmers because they ran out of food. Like there's really no more wars or anything because like everything just like everybody's trying to just survive off of the food they can create. Right. Everybody there's just trying the earth is just trying to feed itself. Yeah. All so right. NASA, like all this exploration stuff is like gone. And they actually have said that like the whole moon landing thing, that was faked. Like that's what they're trying to teach in schools now. They're trying to teach that the moon landing was faked? Yeah, they said it was just like a great thing of propaganda. Like that's what the schools are teaching. Okay. I think it's just this like this big push, like just worry about farming. That's all we that's all we can worry about to survive. There's no reason to look to the stars anymore. Okay. And Matthew McConaughey's character's like really smart. And, like he was you know, they kind of set a point where he's like he was born either forty years too early or forty years too late. All right. So like, you know, he could have been, you know, somebody famous or not famous, but like really influential in the world, but he's born in this time where he couldn't be. Okay. So the idea is that they need to get off Earth and either repopulate. There's like two different plans. One is they can move people, or the other plan is that they have these fertilized eggs that they'll try and like slowly start bringing them together, like whenever they find a habitable planet. All right, all right. So they stumble upon NASA, him and his daughter, which is still existing because he was a fighter pilot or something. Okay. And this is where he learns all this stuff, and yada, yada, yada. They want him to be part of the pilot because he's the only one that's ever flown. And they explained to him that there's this wormhole that they've sent people through, and they found, like, I think a dozen planets that are potentially habitable. Oh. So up to this point, I'm invested. I'm like, okay, this, this is cool. All and right. The way, and the way they found this, like, secret NASA place was somehow gravity had done something to, by binary, show them the coordinates of this NASA place. Okay. And they never really explained it, so I just kind of took it for face value. Like, something that that place is doing is pulled you know, these books off the shelf or something that created this um, binary code that they figured out, oh, okay, these are coordinates for this place. So I kind of give that kind of like, okay, you know, it's kind of weird, but whatever. Up to this point when he gets there and signs up, like, it's it's a good movie. Everybody seems to be acting really well, and everybody seems like like this plot makes sense. Yeah, I mean, the plot the plot so far seems seems totally believable. Like, I, I, I can totally, you know... I can totally buy this. Maybe not so much the the lack of space exploration thing, like where you know the teaching about the moon landing and stuff like that. But I get the whole like you know Earth wanting to feed itself and everybody kind of like slowly developing into agriculture, like nothing but agriculture. Yeah, because everybody just wants to you know not die. Yeah, because uh, you have to eat. You need right. You know, you need to at least sustain what you can. Okay. And so there's a scientist who they keep talking like he's trying to figure out like. He's trying to figure out gravity. Like, he's trying to figure out this this uh, um, algorithm for f- gravity, and they don't really say why. And so he uh, they he's like, by the time you come back, I will have figured out this equation. It's like, okay, I, I, I still don't know why you need to figure out gravity, but okay. Like, I assumed it was for spaceships or something. Okay. So they get in space. They're going to go to Mars first, and then they're going to go to the wormhole. And even up to this point, it all still makes sense, kind of. Um, they go through the wormhole, and it takes them to these three different planets. The, it starts getting kind of weird, and I haven't figured out. Maybe you can explain this, but some of these planets, like, time went faster. So there's this border where when they got past this border, for every hour, it was seven hours, like, normal time. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's uh, it all has to do with, like, rotation and distance of the sun and, and stuff like that. It's like... Uh it's like it's like how uh, like a day on Mars is is way longer than a day on Earth. Yeah, but that makes sense. But I mean, but they're saying you, that time actually itself goes slower. Yeah, yeah. So that might just be like distance to the center of the universe and things like that. Because I mean, 
they actually say that theoretically, if you were near, because they that the center of the universe is this massive fucking star, mm-hmm. and they say that, I mean, it's all hypothetical. Obviously, it's all theoretical. But they say that if you're if you're traveling at the speed of light near the near this gigantic star that gravity coupled with your speed will slow time down for you okay. as compared to the rest of the universe so it might just be like distance to the center of the universe which is why time goes slower maybe and they didn't really explain that real well at least at least i didn't, i mean even then, it's like okay, you know, there's some kind of unknown thing, but that that makes sense. It's like okay, you know, I can kind of buy this, even though it's kind of weird. Because to me, it's like if you're on Mars and I'm on Earth, if you come back in six months, we've both aged six months. Okay. Like I don't know, I don't, I can't really put it in my brain how that would physically change. Right. Um, the relatively thing, yeah, maybe. Uh, so they get to a planet, and there's like a beacon thing that was going off, which to me. If the person wasn't alive, this beacon should go off, but it just constantly kept going. And so they get there, and there's, like, this big water thing. So they're like, oh, shit, this planet isn't great. So they have to go back. And it's okay. been, like, 23 years. And this is just kind of where, like, the the acting seemed to get really bad. Like, there's points where I'm, like, laughing at it because it's just, like, just seemed, like, very... Like, all of a sudden, the acting shifted. Like, it turned into, like, what, like, kind of just, like, wooden... Yeah, well, it's like like the beginning of it's like okay, th- like they're they're doing this this thing and this plot makes sense. All right, and then it seems like at just at this point, everybody's like this this doesn't make much sense. Like they wrote themselves in all these corners, and they just use the like the the thought of like, well, this is unknown, so we can do whatever we want. Okay, because then there's this big argument of like love and. You know, you want to go here because you're in love with this guy, but this other guy is the you know he's given us better readings. So they go to this second planet. And the guy had been there on his own, and it ends up being Matt Damon. Oh, God. Yeah. And his acting was really sour. And so, and this is like two and a half hours into the movie. So, this is the point where I'm like, I. How long is this movie? It's close to three hours. Okay. So, they go to this. So, so they go to this other planet, or they, they go through this wormhole, and they see these three planets, and on one of these planets is Matt Damon. Yep, Matt Damon's on one of them. What, so dude. they go to the first planet, and because they tried to time everything right that they'd have enough fuel, but they got stuck on the one planet for longer than they wanted to. Okay. So when they got back to their main ship, it had been 23 years, so they were really low on fuel. So it's like, well, we can only go to this planet or this planet. All right. And, they're, of course, this is where they throw in, like, the one girl's in love with somebody on the one planet. That's why she wants to go there. But the other guy's been giving them better readings, so that's the one we should go to. Okay. They vote on it. And they vote on it, and they say, "Okay, well, let's go to the let's go to the one with the better readings." And of course, the whole planet's frozen. And so they get him, and he's been like locked into his his uh, like a chamber thing where he sleeps. Okay. And he gets out, and he's like, "Oh, well, you know, in the core, it's like it's better. We've got better readings." Uh, but it ends up being that he did all this because he didn't want to be left on the planet to die alone which kind of makes sense, but then there's this really awkward fight between Matt Damon and Matthew McConaughey. Okay. And like, like he like pushes him down. Phys- like, like, like why, why is it awkward? Well, because they're both in their space suits. Oh, okay. And so, so they're like, kind of eh. wrestling around. So it's like, yeah. like girl slapping? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> and uh, gravity's a little stop bit lighter, it. so they're kind of floating you around. Stop it. Stop it. And there's a part... There's a part where uh, Matthew McConaughey has him pinned down, and uh, I don't remember what he says, but uh, Matt Damon like tries to headbutt him. They both have like their space helmets on, and so he hits him, and Matthew McConaughey's like, oh, if you do this, you have a 50 percent chance of dying." And Matt Damon's like, "I have had worse odds," and then starts just headbutting him and breaks his glass. Nice. <laughs> He does this like awkward walking away, and it's like it's just ter- it's just very bad acting. He keeps looking, he's like, "Oh, are you thinking about your kids? That's what that's what you're gonna think about near your death is your kids." He's like, "Oh, I can't watch, I can't watch," and oh, turns God. around, starts walking away, and he's like, "I'm so sorry for this. Oh, I can't watch, I can't watch." Uh, and so it, it he ends up, of course, living, and 
he radios back to his friends that are things like, hey, I need help, blah, blah, blah. And, All right. You know, one of the guy dies from an explosion, and Matt Damon tries to take over their ship, but he fucks it up and he dies. I'm like, okay, this is getting progressively worse, but all right, let's go with this. <laughs> the thing that like really made me check out, so the scientist I talked about earlier who was trying to uh, deal with gravity and figure it out. Right. He had apparently figured this equation out like before he sent all these people off on this uh, trip. And so there's this really awkward conversation between Matthew McConaughey's daughter, who's now like 23, 33, something like that, okay. and the doctor. Like he's dying on his deathbed. It's almost like they made him into this like evil character at this point. So, the, so the doctor's actually actually a, a bad guy, and he figured out this calculation before he sent everybody off. What was the point? Well, I think I mean it comes from a good place because his thought was, if we tell people, because he he didn't think that getting everybody to this new planet was feasible. Okay. So his thought was the plan B that they'd have to find the most habitable planet and then use the fertilized eggs to repopulate human or keep humans from going extinct. Okay. And so his thought was, if we tell people that that's the only option, then nobody's going to work together because there's no hope for living. Which kind of makes sense, but they brought it out in a really weird way. So, so basically he's saying that regardless of the outcome of the venture, they should still do the venture so that way, they're hope, so that way it, it gives hope to the, to the huddled masses. Yeah, exactly, which makes sense. Okay, I get that. But it just came out in a really weird way. Oh, so, and at this point, so you have this, and this is, like, where, like, the music gets, like, very, like, Friday the 13th for some reason. Oh, shit. And, like, it just, like, it, it, it starts, like, right before the doctor gives his big explanation, and then it's just this weird, weird music for the rest of the movie. So, they decide on trying to get back, um, and they're going to go over this black hole that they were circling, and Matthew McConaughey like is going to sacrifice himself. And, like this is one of the points where I'm like, okay, this is the end of the movie. It's He'll like an Armageddon himself. moment. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But he gets over the black hole, releases into it, and starts bouncing around in it. You're like, okay, this is going to be like a peaceful death. All right. No, no, no. All of a sudden, he's bouncing around, and he kind of like is floating in this like weird like uh, looks like strings all over the place, and he's still alive. As he looks to him, he sees his daughter at a young age okay. in her room, and he's like trying to talk to her and all this stuff. And he's seen the past where he came and saw her and told her that he was doing this, you know, space exploration thing. And he finds out that he can communicate with her. And what you end up finding out is this whole time how they figured out the coordinates. And uh, there's a part where she says that the the Morse code said stay. It all came from him in this like black hole thing that he, and it, at the end he says humans created so so matthew mcconaughey sets the wheels in motion for the trip that puts him where he sets the wheels in motion yeah it's very like it felt like somebody was trying to like outthink the room it's like you know it'll be cool he was the one that started this whole thing so it's kind of like well, uh prometheus in i haven't a way. seen it Okay, well then, never mind. And actually, Prometheus <laughs> wasn't bad, but but it's kind of that same thing. It's like it's that whole "what came first, the chicken or the egg" kind of argument. Yeah, it was just, and I don't really know how I feel about that stuff. It just it seems like it's a way to be like, oh well, no, it makes sense because you know he's the one that said it from the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he he was the one that said stay, and it's like, listen, you you know that didn't work. This totally seems See, like something that Christopher Nolan would do. Because I, I know you haven't seen Inception, but Inception is that whole it, it's that whole same kind of thing where it's like, ooh ooh mind fuck, I'm gonna mind yeah. fuck. And it's like it's not really a mind fuck, and then and so. All that happens, and all of a sudden the black hole starts closing on him, and it sends him like a shit ton into the future. And so he gets to see his dying daughter, who's like 120 some years old, okay. or 100, like 90 years old. And he's 120, but he's the same age. And uh, it it was rough. It was very <laughs> rough. It's it. You just walk in there, and it feels like somebody was like just really trying to outthink the room. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It sounds like it sounds like Christopher Nolan. Like like I said, I know you haven't seen Inception, but Inception was. It was kind of the same thing. I mean, it was done very cool. And I, I mean, like visually, it was, I mean, visually, it looks stunning. And I mean, the plot 
the plot was kind of there. I mean, it has its holes and stuff like that, and it has its moments where it's like, ooh, where it yeah. seems like you almost want him to like look in the camera and be like, what? <laughs> but you would get it if you were smarter, right? 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 But I mean, I don't know. So, so does this make Christopher Nolan like the M Night Shyamalan of of today? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it, except like M. Night Shyamalan, his movies weren't as like visually like, you know, uh, oh, what's the dude that does all the explosions? Michael Bay. They're not really Michael Bay kind of movies. They're very like, you know, just people oriented. Yeah. Whereas it seems like Christopher Nolan's are very Michael Bayish. It's like these big, fancy, you know, amazing shots of like space travel or, you know, in dream inception type stuff. Right. And. <sighs> I always feel like it's like you, you 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 have to hit both. Like if I go to a movie and it's it's visually like beautiful, it's like all right, but if the plot's not there then I check out. Like we see all these beautiful things all the time. You know, TV's getting to the point where we can see these beautiful things. I want a good story and a good plot. Yeah. I think, you know, and I think that's I, that's what I gravitate towards. Like to me, I don't look it's it's so weird. I don't look at sh- I, when I look at shows now. I look at the writing staff. I look at who yeah. the writer is, and then I'm like, that's what I'll latch on to. Aaron Sorkin. I fucking like. I'm a I'm a closet West Wing junkie. I loved that fucking show. Um, and so I went and looked at his other shows. Um, he did one called uh, Thirty Rock. Okay. Um. Or no, not Thirty Rock. He didn't do Thirty Rock. Uh, That's the NBC show. It, it it it's it was on NBC. It was called I think it was like uh, something on the Sunset Strip. It was it didn't last very long. It was only I, I think it only went for a season. I watched that. That was really good. But then he went on and did uh, the Newsroom on HBO. Oh, I've heard that. Oh, really good. it is so good. I um, you see uh, the very first like uh, five minutes or something of the very first episode of the newsroom, you can see that thing all over YouTube. And, and, okay. and like, I've seen like people post it all the time. You know, it's that whole, uh, uh, where Jeff Daniels is sitting in a chair and someone asks him, you know, why America is the greatest country in the world. And he says that it's not the greatest country in the world to this, like, you know, this, uh, I, to this audience of college kids and they're all just get like slack jawed. Huh. That sounds amazing. I'll, I'll have to, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll find the clip and I'll post it on Facebook. It's, it's really, okay. it's really, it's really, I, at, uh, based on those three minutes of, of, of footage, it made me want to watch the show. And then I started watching the show and I fell in love. Fell in love okay. with the show. Great fucking show on HBO, the newsroom. And it just it they're in their last few episodes of it now. Like they just started uh not beginning in November. So so good. Really good show. Yeah, it's always funny, like uh just recently somebody was talking about Interstellar too, like I don't know if you've had these situations, but he started, he's like, oh, I went and saw Interstellar, and I was about to be like, oh, my God, I hated that movie. But before I could get that out, he's like, it was a great movie. It was one of my favorite movies probably Ouch. ever. And yeah. you're like, you know what a great movie is? Waiting. <laughs> Kitchen, bring it around. Yeah. Order up. All right, well, uh, is there anything else you want to add before I do a little housekeeping? Um, No. I was trying to think of something clever and witty, and I got nothing. All righty. Well, uh, if you want to follow us uh, on Twitter, we're at Language of Bro. Uh, go ahead and email us at languageofbromance at gmail.com. Our website is languageofbromance.com. Uh, and always, of course, like us on Facebook and leave us a comment and subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher. And make sure to check us out on the Pod Bros Network. Pod Bros. Do, do, do. All right. Was well, there anything else you want to add before um, we close it out? Um, shit. No, because I I didn't think of anything new in that time. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, that's all the bromance we have for this show. I'm Sean, and I'm Richard, and I say we eat the beaver. That's that's served to you by probably an immigrant. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs>